Okay, I think we are going to get started here. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining uh, today's webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about scheduling policies. Um, and specifically, we'll be talking about creating data-driven scheduling policies and shifting the culture on campus with Northern Arizona University. Um, I'd love to start by introducing myself for those of you that don't know me. Uh, I'm Justin Wenning. I'm CEO and co-founder of Course Dog. Uh, Course Dog is, the story of Course Dog is, I was a student at Columbia University, uh, became really interested in the way that universities built their class schedule plans. Um, and started by helping uh, Columbia Law School with class schedule planning. Today, Course Dog works with about 50 institutions um, from large schools like BYU to um, small and mid-sized schools like the SUNY schools with class curriculum uh, catalog and event schedule planning. Um, and we've had about 30 universities that have switched off of us, uh, off of um, some traditional tools to use our platform. Um, I am incredibly excited today um, to be here with some incredible folks that, in my opinion, have built quite possibly the most comprehensive scheduling policies and undergone one of the most incredible cultural shifts out of any school that I've seen in the country. Um, and we're going to use today just to talk about them. Um, and, and I'm just incredibly grateful to have them here today. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I'd love to turn it over to John Massarini at uh, Northern Arizona University. I, before I give it to you, John, uh, I'd love to just give the anecdote that when I went to visit John on campus, um, everyone that I met with said that he was one of the smartest, uh, brightest, and, and most talented um, vice provosts that they'd ever worked with. Um, and he has done an incredible job of building the scheduling culture and the culture in general at NAU. Uh, and I'm incredibly proud to have him today. Job. Well, thank you, Justin. That is quite flattering. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the kudos and uh, uh, it's very exciting for us to be here today. As Justin said, I'm Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at Northern Arizona University. Um, I've been in this role a little over a year now and uh, sitting next to me is uh, my colleague Benita Sotala, who is one of the Associate Registrars and uh, our uh, Office of the Registrar. And uh, Benita's been here for a while and has, has a great, great understanding of the history and the landscape of this very tricky area. And uh, when we start, you know, we, we, I'd like to turn it over to Benita to sort of take you through a journey, sort of where we started and where we are now and how all of this sort of played out. So I'll turn it over to Benita for a bit. Hi. Yes. Um, well, we experience the same pain points that many other universities experience in terms of scheduling. Um, so many of our classes were not built um, by the time we published. And so students weren't able to uh, view and to plan their schedules um, as they should have been able to. Um, a lot of other classes were built after the published date um, and after enrollment. Uh, once again, not allowing them to really see a full schedule. And it also um, kind of uh, all the data integrity reviews that we ran to ensure that uh, everything was built accurately uh, were no longer effective because uh, these classes were built after the reviews were completed. Um, and then we had the same issues um, that many have where a uh, number of classes are built outside standard meeting times. And of course, that impacts uh, utilization of, uh, of our buildings. And it uh, doesn't allow students to maximize their schedules. It also impacts final exams and things like passing time. Many, many areas are impacted by that. And then there are classes, uh, there were a large number of classes that were clumped um, during peak hours. And we actually did have one college that didn't start scheduling until noon on Mondays and ended on Thursdays in the evening. And so that impacted our uh, South Campus, uh, all the units that scheduled classes on South Campus. Uh, so a number of issues that we felt we needed to address to help students so that uh, they weren't um, hitting roadblocks during enrollment. Um, 
So we created uh, scheduling requirements and those scheduling requirements would be things like how you treat blended classes, how you want to balance them. So there, if it's a Monday, Wednesday meeting pattern, a Monday is in person and uh, it's balanced with another Monday, Wednesday where the Wednesday is in person. So different types of scheduling requirements and we updated our manuals. Uh, we had talking sessions with deans, associate deans and schedulers invited to those and we wanted to bring people, we wanted to get buy-in for uh, scheduling requirements. And we were also starting to look at centralized scheduling as a solution so that things were built, all classes were built in a consistent manner and following best practices. Um, so then um, multi-term enrollment was introduced. <laughs> and, and that, um, well, the time frame was shorter chuckling right now. <laughs> yeah, the time frame was shorter for implementation on that than we expected. And so that poured gasoline on what was already beginning to become a fire. Um, and we found ourselves without adequate time for implementation of better practices. And we knew we had to find ways to build uh, schedules even further out. So the first year, suffice it to say, did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I became vice provost, uh, <laughs> which was great. Uh, so yeah, so Vanina is giving you a great uh, lead up to, I stepped into this role uh, a little over a year ago and we had just had that first year where it just didn't go very well. So uh, my thought was, okay, everyone around the university is yelling and everyone's working really hard and no one's happy. So I needed to stop and take inventory. So my approach to it was to be very upfront, was to get in front of rooms, uh, get into rooms in front of large groups of people, faculty, chairs, deans, associate deans, and say, hey everyone, everyone's working really hard and no one's happy. So something is wrong, we need to fix this. And that just sort of brought everything down about three notches. The anxiety level sort of went down. In fact, one, one faculty member said, wow, this is the first time anyone in the administration has ever admitted something isn't good. And I said, well, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to realize this is not working and we need to make it better. Um, and the other thing was to, to sort of sift out the ideas from the practice. The idea of multi-term enrollment is very good and students like it and it helps with persistence and, and retention and all those things. Centralized scheduling in itself is good because we need to look at the structure of the university and how we're utilizing our resources, not just classrooms, but all other resources on campus during, dur during times. All of these things are good, but they just weren't being played out in the best way possible and they didn't have we didn't have enough buy-in from folks so addressing those issues up front having that wide-reaching dialogue uh, the other thing was it took me to come in and say look we already have scheduling requirements these are going to be enforced it's no longer going to be acceptable for you to bully your way into make into uh, Benita's team doing things just because you want them to be that way. We are going to enforce them. And if that means I'm the one who's saying no, then I'll be happy to say no. That really helped Benita's team a lot because they were often on the receiving end of very frustrated, angry faculty members and chairs. So I sort of had to level the playing field here and say, hey, look, you're taking it out on the wrong people. You need to treat people with respect and we need to have better discussions. If you're frustrated with something, you need to talk about it with me and we'll find a solution. So it was sort of put, it sort of hit a big reset button on everything from how we do things to the discourse around it. Um, and then the next thing I did is, well, um, I looked at the whole picture and I said, well, I can see why people are frustrated. Our scheduling is not really aligned with the, uh, the uh, enrollment cycle. 
So we're asking units to make decisions before they have data that can drive those decisions. So we, we immediately aligned all the pieces of scheduling onto the university-wide schedules. So uh, when they build things, I provided them all the resources with historical data, retention, uh, enrollment, uh, graduation rates, credit, student credit hour production and then the application funnels so that they could have historical data to make that initial build. Then I aligned the review with the 21 day census. Uh, the problem was we ran robust analyses about how courses are being scheduled and how many we need and all that sort of stuff, but it was happening before we had the 21 day census. So the information was basically useless. So I aligned it with the 21 day census. Um, just yeah. Sorry, just for folks in the audience, could you clarify what the 21 day census? Because I think there's some folks that might be a little bit confused about that terminology. Oh, so the 21 day census is sort of our official count on enrollment. We have first day of term, we have 21 day census, and then we have 45 day census. The 21 day census is what we report to our Arizona Board of Regents on our official enrollment. So, um, so really, as everyone knows, things move quite a bit in those first few weeks, once things start to settle out, then you can really start looking at enrollment in a robust way. So just aligning everything with academic calendars, because faculty were complaining that so many decisions were being made when they're not on contract. So I said, well, then we need to change that. So we did that and that uh, bought us a lot of goodwill and a lot of good um, trust that we really did want their input and we really were trying to make sure maximize the time that they were on campus. Um, addressing the why, taking advantage of the de-escalation to make necessary changes, um, and then also just emphasizing to everyone that it's a continuous process. There's no one thing that's going to make everything better. It's a combination of things and we're constantly building on those things. Um, and then um, so then, that all happened before we even knew Course Dog existed. We had to get our ship in order before we could even start to look for a technological solution to make things seamless, better, more robust, and things like that. But if we didn't have the right kind of policies in campus culture around why we schedule the way we do, no technological solution was gonna work for us. So once we started right-sizing the ship and getting us back on board with why we're doing what we're doing, uh, I asked Benita to sort of look for some technolo technological solutions that would make the building process easier, provide everyone with the wide scope, not just us, and uh, to do away with spreadsheets and Qualtrics surveys, which is our main driving, even right now, we haven't fully implemented everything yet, so we're using a lot of spreadsheets and Qualtrics surveys to get to the information we need. So that's, uh, that's what I did, and then so, Benita went yeah, out. Yeah, we, we, we looked up um, other, uh, every classroom scheduling uh, system that we could find. Uh, I did come across Course Dog, um, but I wasn't sure what Course Dog did. So Justin, um, we're not the only folks that have come a long way. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so true. Yeah, so uh, one of our um, BAs, uh, she came across it as well, and then she forwarded it to me, and it brought it back to my attention, and I thought, okay, I'm going to figure out what these folks do, and so I made contact with you, and, uh, and here we are. Um, you provided a lot of demos, and, um, and we were very impressed. Awesome, yeah, no, and, and I guess I'm happy to um, come in here, you know, and I think the that context was in, incredibly useful i, I want to keep the i think that you know for folks in the crowd they're most interested in hearing about how obviously nau shifted the culture and i think there's so many insights to just take out of what we just discussed but i guess just for folks in the crowd i'd love to just quickly for three minutes um show how course dog is augmenting um nau's uh schedule scheduling policies and provided kind of that technological solution that, you know, now that we have um, rules in place and a data-driven culture at the university, 
how Course Dog is able to help. Um, so for a lot of you, you may be familiar with room scheduling tools or tools that help with the process of actually um, optimizing your physical space. Um, Course Dog is unique in that we are a platform that actually helps to build scheduling policies, provide an interface for departments to build schedules or units, departments, units to build uh, the schedule within these policies. And then that also provides reports and analytics to help you to visualize how that section schedule is coming together. We also do rooms and optimization. Um, but what I want to do today is just show how this would, this, you know, what this looks like at a school like NAU that's super interested in specifically creating scheduling policies to make sure that our students graduate on time and that we're, you know, we're actually um, maximizing our physical space. So what CourseLog does is we actually have a really tight bi-directional integration with all major SIS systems. So at NAU, they use PeopleSoft. We integrate with Banner Schools, any Elucian products, Genzibar, other SIS systems. And we pull out historical data that provide some analysis tools to help you understand how you're doing. So at NAU, this process, you know, before they had course dog was something that um, they did a deep discovery into. How is the schedule distributed? How is it creating bottlenecks for our students? What does our space utilization and seat utilization look like? And these are some of the reports that course dog actually provides out of the box. What course dog then does is as a university registrar or as a centralized office, that looks over the departmental scheduling process, CourseLog enables you to create rules that make sure that departments or, unit or units are building schedules within these policies. So an example might be a distribution rule saying, hey, you know, a primetime rule, like we can't have more than 50% of our sections from 10 to two. What we were actually talking about earlier today, John, Benita and I was, you know, at some institutions, really forward-looking institutions, um, they'll say, you know, for each meeting pattern, we don't want our actual departments to be able to make more than X percent of assignments within that meeting pattern. So saying, you know, at NAU, it might be 6%. We don't want more than 6% of classes in the 9 to 10 o'clock time block, um, for example. And in turn, what this does is we provide a department, once the registrar of the central office sets up these rules and policies based on their data, we actually provide an interface where departments can go in and build schedules within these policies much more seamlessly. So one of the challenges that a lot of you may have and in a lot of large decentralized institutions or any type of institution is building schedules that actually fall within policies and not making it a hassle for your units and departments to be able to do that. CourseDog provides these automatic conflict checks. For example, hey, Bio 101 and Chem 101 can't be taught at the same time. This is gonna create a bottleneck for students. Or hey, you're, you know, if you wanna select a non-standard meeting pattern, let's make sure this gets routed through a workflow to the centralized office or to the registrar's office for approval. And this interface allows departments to visualize all of this information in real time and allows the centralized office or the registrar's office or whoever it may be to literally just sit on a request dashboard, seeing all of the weird things, all the exception requests, any, if any of you, do you, any of you get after the fact change requests, imagine if they could all be routed to you via workflow. And this makes it so that you can really seamlessly set rules, sit back on your dashboard and be able to finally have those scheduling policies in place in a way that's not intrusive to departments and gives departments and units a tool they actually love to use. So that's the core use case of course dog on the rule side. Um, there's obviously a lot more here, but I'm going to turn this back over to John and Benita um, to talk a little bit more about their processes. Um, and maybe after that, we can open it up to Q&A for if anyone has additional questions. Great. Thanks, Justin. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, 
without John's support, and we've, we've brought that up, but without the provost support, it, uh, provost office support, it would really not be possible for us to be successful in, um, in adhering to scheduling practices, um, getting academic units to adhere to scheduling practices. And when I spoke to other universities, those that seemed to be successful were those that had that support. Those that were struggling were, um, were universities that uh, did not have that support. Yeah, and really, again, it was important for me to establish trust with people on campus. Um, prior to this role, I was associate dean of the graduate college for five years. So I knew, I knew a lot of people. people. A lot of people knew me, as most graduate colleges work across all disciplines. Um, and I, but I think it was important to acknowledge the pain points. It was important to acknowledge the frustrations. It was important to acknowledge that this is a complicated process and it's not perfect. Uh, if, for those of you who don't know, NAU, we have all about 31,000 students here. 26,000 of them are here on the Flagstaff Mountain campus. So it, it, this was not a, this was, this is a complicated thing. Um, so first point was to really show that I was willing to listen and be a collaborator. So having those uh, open forums, I scheduled three open forums with the general faculty. I visited the chairs council. I knew, already knew the associate deans intimately and met with them. I met with the deans. I, I sort of got, and, and we're also, you know, meeting with the students uh, about all of these sorts of things and setting up these opportunities. Um, so it was important for me to communicate to the faculty what, was happening on Benita's side is because the faculty didn't quite understand that there were actual people behind those emails they were sending. And these were people who were dedicating themselves to making sure this works well and often working 50 to 60 hours a week because they took on such a huge responsibility on their shoulders thinking the whole thing was going to fall apart if they didn't do stuff. They were working themselves to exhaustion. And I stepped in and said, this can't happen anymore. We've got to have a reasonable way of going about it. And we've got to change the culture a little bit. On the other side, uh, I also took it upon myself to sort of help uh, Benita's team also understand the academic culture. Because what was happening on that side, I felt, was the, well, but John's their boss. Why don't they just do what he says? <laughs> and I'm sure you're all laughing right now, yeah. is that it doesn't quite work that way. And there is an academic culture part of it. And plus, there were also lots of initiatives going on on the academic side that Benita's team didn't, weren't necessarily aware of. You know, the fact that enrollment uh, nationwide is going down. We have to streamline, we have to cut things, we're gonna have to move things at certain times and understanding that when changes come, it's not because the units didn't plan ahead, ahead. It's because they had other things to do. So the both sides understanding the cultures was really important. Um, right now we're actually developing these quote unquote formal policies but we're developing them with the mind of this is the philosophy around how we schedule courses the details the processes the business decisions those belong in a separate document that can be referenced and changed according to what we're doing but what's the overall philosophy behind why we schedule the way we do um, and then uh, right now, we, I just got a bunch of data on standard meeting time blocks and usage, and that is shaping what we're doing. And if I could give everybody one piece of advice is presenting faculty with data to support the why will buy you so much more uh, credibility. I mean, you, they, people, I've often said this, and, I, and people have actually told me this. They're like, John, I don't necessarily like what, we, what you've done, but I respect it and I understand it. And so to me, that's a win. I uh, don't have to have everybody like what we're doing, but I at least want people to go, yep, yeah, but it makes sense. I just don't happen to like it this way. That's okay. We can work with that. Um, so now we're ready for course talk.
<laughs> and um, uh, we're putting our policies to practice. That's the thing. And, and this is something that I wanted to emphasize as well. So we're figuring out this sort of what is the percentage that we're going to put the rules on. And the thing that I'd said to Benita, we're going to keep emphasizing over and over again, because it's true, is nothing has changed. These same practices and, and, and guidelines that we've been given completely align with the rules we're going to put in. So this idea that, oh, now you're making us do something different, it's like, no, we're actually finding a better way to enforce it so that everyone can read the words from following the guidelines. That's really what it is. It's leveling the playing field for the units that are following the rules. And uh, we're really happy about that. Um, you know, again, planning, the ease of the process. And plus it was important for us to allow people to feel like that they have the ability to enter this in themselves, to give them that part of that psychological control of I'm actually building this rather than I'm gonna send a spreadsheet and I'm gonna rely on somebody to maybe build it, but if they don't like this, they're gonna change it. Um, that wasn't what was going on, but that was the perception. But now it's like, no, here you go. Build it, do it, play with the tool. Maybe you'll find solutions that you never even thought was possible because now you finally have a robust tool that gives you a full picture. A spreadsheet from your unit does not give you a full picture. And that's the thing that we're trying to emphasize. And the other part that was very attractive to us for Course Dog is the visual aspect. It's very visual. And I think more and more people really enjoy that visual uh, uh, approach. They learn better that way. They react better that way. So we're pretty excited about that. Did you want to add anything? Did I forget anything? No, I think, uh, I think you covered it. Yeah. Okay. Um, see, I mean, look how pretty that is. <laughs> that's, just, that's just gorgeous. You're pointing at me, right, John? Or yes, you, yes, no. look how pretty Justin is. Oh, and look how pretty his schedule wow. is, too. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's great. And, and the other, there was another aspect of it that impressed me because, you know, again, we have a lot of students. We have a lot of different disciplines on campus, but there are a lot of intersection points between disciplines. So to be able to click a button and see some other department's schedule is huge because then you're not having to call and you know it's you can see things and if you see issues you can talk it out but you know well perfect example for us is our nursing program and the intersection between that and biology 181 it's like okay you got to make sure you have enough room for kids to go over and do their 181 and that's not going to conflict with the beginning nursing classes and things like that so yeah, I love that. Yeah, and this is great because it will allow them to put that bio 181 in there and it will give them a warning if they're trying to schedule it at the exact same time. Right, which Justin's showing you right now. So it's just fantastic the way uh, it's gonna actually lead to um, more cross unit collaboration because you can like go, oh, I wonder what this department's doing. And then they, you can talk it out instead of just sort of relying on those historical things. <laughs> and it's great for planning too. I mean, the, they, uh, academic units didn't have the ability to go in and really move things around and, and make adjustments because um, it hadn't been published yet. Right, so now they can go in and they can move things around and they can see what it looks like if they do this versus this. Um, and there are, it, there's just some robust um, uh, abilities that it allows. Yeah. Awesome. I have a million questions because I, have, I think that um, there's so much to unpack from what you folks just covered. Um, but I'd love to start. I know that there are probably a bunch of folks. I was just thinking about um, John when you were, when you, when you when you when you said how these folks are working 50, 60 hours a week. I'm sure there are so many people that are join, joining us here today that are like, yes, like that's me, like save me. Um, I want to give them a little bit of time and open it up to their questions, and then 
um, hopefully I'll be, I'll be greedy and ask a bunch of my questions as well. So <laughs> let's see if we, I'm going to open up the Q and A right now. Let me stop my share. Let's see, how do I do this? So I'm seeing some of the, so folks, for those of you that, um, want to submit questions. I see we have a, a, a bunch coming through right now. Um, we have at the bottom of your Zoom modal is a Q&A button that you can click and then actually submit questions directly. Um, and then I'll just raise those questions here um, as, as we obviously talk through this. Uh, the first questions that we got, um, I guess the one of the things that I, I just got a question coming in um, from a, 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 someone named Jude who had a great question. Um, for all the registrars that are here, you know, folks like Benita that have struggled with this process of maybe getting support from a vice provost or getting administrative or institutional support to implement scheduling policies and, and change the way of doing things. Um, I guess I'm curious hearing from either of you, you know, John, how did you learn of this and realize that this was a priority in the first place? And then Benita, on your end, how did you make it clear to John um, or, or you know, to the administration how important this was in the larger context of student success? Why don't you start? I don't think I had to make it clear because I think that um, it was clear just because <clears throat> we um, had both of those big implementations at the same time, centralized scheduling, multi-term enrollment, as I said, <clears throat> it, um, it occurred in a very short time frame, so there wasn't the opportunity uh, for buy-in for educating folks on the whys. Um, and so we were just very fortunate that, um, that John came along. Um, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know, John, how do you, how do you convince someone um, of its importance if they're not wired that way? Um, I think that's a really good question. For me, it was a, it, for me, it was absolutely 100% a, a a human problem is that people were being devalued and I could not stand by and have people be devalued and um, it was absolutely completely against everything I believe as a leader um, and as a collaborator and so when I was hearing stories about how people were getting yelled at how people were uh, sending horribly inappropriate and nasty messages, how people were uh, just like, you know, it, it, I thought this is sort of, this is a human crisis and we need to step in and we need to do better. And so I started by sharing with faculty who these people are in the registrar's office. Who are these people? And and really having them take a long look and really reflect on how they treat staff on this campus. And as we know, sometimes those relationships can be difficult because faculty, um, and I'm a faculty member, been an academic my entire life, but um, faculty can sometimes approach it as, okay, you need to do this service for me because that's your job. And when you don't do this service for me, it's sort of this audacity of why are you not doing this? I'm the faculty member, you need to do this. And me sort of coming in and saying, well, actually, you know, these people don't work for you. They work for the university and we need to do what's best in the university. And me putting myself in the line of fire to say, if you have a problem, you yell at me you come and you send me the nasty email and we will talk it out, but you don't treat people this way. Um, that's really how I felt like I could show in a fast way our support. Then, on um, then it wasn't just, didn't just stop there though. Then I had to say, okay, we need to look at this process and make it better and start to build those things out. But really it started with the, people were just angry all the time. And there just there was no reason for that. And I think if you're at a university where there isn't that level of angst going on, that maybe going back to that data 
is um, is a way that um, you um, can uh, show and convince the provost's office of the importance of uh, following those scheduling requirements. If you can show that um, your room utilization is very poor, and here's why, there's no adherence to the standard meeting times, um, we're clumping during peak hours, um, uh, we, we have issues with uh, co-convene classes not being approved and, um, you know, just um, providing the data um, because as John said, really, that is, um, that's what gets everyone's attention um, as showing here's what we look like, here's what we could look like. Awesome. Um, another question, it, it looks like um, we've got a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, one of the um, you know interesting um, questions that we have come in is um, so someone was asking a little bit about how you developed relationships between courses or how you current at least in your previous way kind of were tracking that information. Is that coming from curriculum maps? Is that something you had to work with departments to collaborate on? Um, you know, how does it look to actually think about like what courses? Are going to create bottlenecks for students when they're at the same time or different times. You know, how did you define that out? Uh, well, we knew it was an issue when students tried to enroll and um, they had the roadblock of, <clears throat> hey, we, we can't. Um, this class is scheduled at the same time, and that was, and that happened uh, every um, every time enrollment opened. So we identified that as an issue. We asked units to reach out to, uh, to identify those classes um, or courses uh, in their schedule and to reach out to other units and have those communications. Now we actually did hear from some like, I've got to talk to them. <laughs> and, um, and so <laughs> that was, uh, it was, it was interesting. And that's why when you're pointing out that you can actually input that in the build and, and you may not have to then talk to them. Um, it may be more doable. You may get more compliance that way. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, we, it, was, it was clear during enrollment, every, every time enrollment opened, it was very clear to us where the bottlenecks were, where the roadblocks were, what the problems were for students. Yeah. And then that was Bonita's team being proactive about reaching out directly to the chairs of those units and saying, look, you have to talk to, you know, chair member X, you need to speak to chairperson Y, because you keep coming up with this issue between bio 181 and nursing 100. And then they, we would leave it to them to be responsible to do that. And, you know, NAU, I feel like, is one of the leaders in the country when it comes to this idea of really, really the students, you know, looking to the student-centered approach. So when we framed it in the way of your students are not going to be able to progress, your students are frustrated, your students are not able to get the classes they need in a timely way, uh, they reacted quickly. It wasn't about, we want this schedule to look a certain way. It was that we are not able to provide our students with what they need when they need it. And I think constantly reframing it that way helps because 99.9% .9 of faculty would say, well, of course we wanna help them do that. And that's not in chairs and all of those people. So I say, Anytime you're trying to implement something like this, it's not necessarily as well, we want to enforce these rules because we just know that this is going to be better. We like this. It's like, no, we're serving the students in a better way when we do it this way. And here are all the reasons how we serve the students in better ways. It might not be direct, but it's often indirect. Freeing up capacity means you have more flexibility when something goes awry. Spreading, spreading classes out more evenly across all meeting patterns means students aren't running into transportation problems and, and, uh, and you know, access problems and all these things. You know, it's again, it's about we're here for the students. So let's frame it that way every time. And it's, it's more meaningful. I think that's more meaningful work than, oh, we just like, what, we just like to have a pretty schedule. 
No, I think that's, that's spot on. Um, it, as long as, I, I think that um, many of the academic units, the, the reasons that they're doing things is, is not that they're trying to circumvent um, or um, uh, bypass a process. It's that they don't necessarily understand um, the why. Um, and that's what uh, John mm -hmm. did is help them to understand the why behind it. And, and again, why impacted students? Yeah, and again, I'm a faculty member. I get it. There are some who are like, you know what? I love my Tuesday, Thursday schedule. I can do my research on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, you know, it, it all works beautifully. But I'm also a faculty member in the School of Music. We teach five days a week, period, all of us, because that's just the nature of the discipline, especially when you're a performer like me, you teach five days a week. So to me, this like idea of, oh, I only teach Tuesdays and Thursdays was completely foreign. And I, but you know what, I respect it. But on the same side is the chairs can take a role in saying, look, I would like everyone to have a wonderful schedule, but let's start with the student needs and then let's go to this. And maybe there's some sort of system where we're rotating through. Once every four semesters, you're gonna get your wonderful, perfect Tuesday, Thursday. But if we need you on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're gonna to have to place you there because that's what the students need. So. Have, being brave and having those conversations is really important. And I think John gave them the permission, chairs the permission to say, no, you know what, um, this, um, to, to, to faculty, this isn't um, in the best interest of students. This isn't student-centered. Yeah, and so he gave them permission. I think that many of the chairs didn't feel, uh, they felt powerless. They didn't feel that they could <clears throat> make those statements. Yeah. Um, so that was huge. Yeah, <laughs> totally. That, that that's awesome. We have got so many questions coming through here. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'll try my best to surface for those of you that don't get your questions answered for today. Um, I promise you that I am not. I will definitely respond to your emails if you have questions for me. And I'm sure John and Benita will talk to you as well. Um, yeah. I'll speak for them. Um, another question that um, we we have here is. Um, when you were evaluating um, vendors for a um, product to work with scheduling rules and you know, department and, and obviously um, department scheduling and improving the data in your process, um, someone asked, I'm curious about, curious about this, um, what are the features that you felt like Course Dog was lacking, if any, and, and how was it different from what else you saw um, that was available on the market slash did you already use some type of scheduling tool before? I just think that with Course Dog, I think it's a it's a positive that um, that you're fairly new because rather than us fitting into your structure, yes. you're fitting into our structure, and that's huge for us. That's mm -hmm. huge. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's sort of the ethos of Course Dog. Um, when I first got into this position, I was whisked off to a student success conference and. And Benita had mentioned another course scheduling tool, which just so happened to be at this conference I was at. So I went to their demo and, or their, their session, and it was very much about us fitting in with them. And this is what we do, and this is why you're going to do it this way. And this is, and it was very, and I came back, I was like, Benita, I hate to be unsupportive, but I don't think this is the right tool for us because it doesn't feel like we have, any freedom to really have a robust conversation. And that's when she went back out and found Course Talk. So I feel like it, it's a tool that really allows you to fit in a way that makes sense to you and quite frankly, that's meaningful. And um, you know, that's just what we're doing right now. We're, we're feeling our way through it. We're doing these different things. I mean, and we're, we're not utilizing every single thing yet because again, it's about us feeling good and have a meaningful relationship. And that's the thing. When Justin came and met with us on campus, it's like, okay, this feels like a meaningful relationship. And it was, it was easy then to, to make the commitment, so. That's, that's very nice of you. <laughs> um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure as well. Um, another question that we have here is, and I, I'm getting a lot of questions that are kind of a little bit, for the ones that are super specific to course dog, I want to make sure that we're 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm just picking for the ones that I think that it would be super useful to get John and Benita's insights for today. But someone was asking, um, what type of reports do you folks look at during the schedule planning process? Um, and I'm happy to just go through, you know, some of them that are in course log, but, you know, what type of, um, in terms of time distribution or space utilization or demand analytics, you know, what are some of the different types of reports that you folks are running to make data-driven decisions about the scheduling policies that you need to create? Well, actually, right now we're we're doing the man we're we're manually putting together that um, that data, but through Course Dog, we're looking forward to being able to utilize the reports that are available in Course Dog. So um, so we're looking at things such as um, peak hours. Um, <clears throat> uh, we. Um, we, we also look at building utilization, um, pre-assigned rooms or rather rooms that are pulled from use um, because they're specialized equipment or there might be computers, et cetera, and looking at their usage. Um, so we're just there. We dabble in a, a number of different um, areas looking to see uh, what, uh, what we can tweak. Um, but we, I, quite honestly, right now, we don't have all the reports in, uh, that are easily accessible, mm -hmm. um, such as these reports that we're seeing um, on our screen with the um, hourly distribution, the utilization mm -hmm. by hour. Those are all, all reports that we are very much looking forward to being able to um, easily access. Yeah, because we have this data, but it's very clunky. Mm -hmm. We run reports through our enterprise reporting system and in compiling it, and it's very difficult. So uh, I'm encouraging Benita as much as possible that we start, that we don't rush. We, we start slow. So what we're doing is let's, let's address the most immediate issues. The most immediate issues are utilization, uh, you know, peak hours, how are things flowing and what are the bottlenecks? Where are students uh, running into issues? That's our first round. Then we can move to then classroom usage itself. Um, we're, we're con of course, th this isn't done in isolation. We're constantly improving these things as we go, but I also wanna sort of build it out slowly so I can see us in the future then, okay, when we're ready for the next thing, what are the other reports we're gonna be access accessing? But for right now, it's that utilization, bottlenecks, conflicts, all of those sorts of things are going to be so useful to just be there right at a touch. And uh, I think it's going to be really compelling. Another question that we're getting, um, and that, that, that's super helpful context, um, thank you, John and Benita, um, is what does your process look like? You know, a lot of folks are, I think, um, in the kind of the traditional way that you describe, you know, they're on Excel sheets or something of the sort. They submit the schedule and then there's some sort of, I guess, manual review period that needs to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then likewise, there's challenges because departments don't have visibility with each other and maybe there's errors or you know, there's no way for them to identify. Them. Um, I think some folks are asking, you know, in, in your, you know, when you think about the workflow and the way that data flows, you know, someone needs a custom time block, if they need something weird, if they go off grid, um, talk me through how um, that works, you know, in an ideal process for you. And then I'll probably talk a little bit as well about how you can set up workflows and course log to accommodate different scenarios. So how it currently works is we have the spreadsheets and we have um, <laughs> four program coordinators and they're each assigned to specific units. So they're, um, they, they know those units very well. Um, they have good relationships with the, the chairs and the schedulers. And, um, and we have something that we call a pre-assignment spreadsheet for those rooms that need to be pre-assigned. And we also have a tab on there for unique um, circumstances. So anything that's unique about that unit um, and their needs go on that spreadsheet. That's not the best way. You know, we're hoping that, you know, through rules, we're able to handle that and we don't have to look at that spreadsheet. But currently, that's how we identify anything that's unique about them. You know, this class has uh, three breakout sessions and one will be held in the room it's currently scheduled in. Uh, this, uh, you know, all those unique things go into that. And so when we get the spreadsheet, we review that unique spreadsheet 
just to reacquaint ourselves with what's unique about that unit mm -hmm. and their build. We make certain that it's in that build. We run a spreadsheet for all lecture zero unit labs. We make sure that we identify all of those and that they're built correctly. There are different queries. We have 65 different queries that we run at different times, at different intervals. And those queries will tell us that these are things we need to pay special attention to as we are completing their builds because they may not be fully aware of the needs when they're built, when they're requesting those classes. Right. So, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's kind of where we begin as far, or what we do as far as building out their classes and understanding what their needs are. But then course dogs gonna help alleviate that oh, pain yes. by what? Oh, well, we, we went through those queries. Um, our business analyst Todd and I went through those queries and we, um, through rules, we feel like we'll be able to reduce them by, I'm going to say 75%. Wow. We'll be taken care of by the course dog rules. And that's our whole point in this is that we don't want this to be a cumbersome process. We want units to be able to go in and have the ability to build those classes themselves. And the rules will protect that they will follow the scheduling requirements. They will force, um, I don't like the word force, but they will allow the units to be in compliance with what our scheduling requirements are. Well, they'll reinforce mm -hmm. what it is that is necessary for this to work as the whole picture. Again, this idea is, you know, the, the idea is you have your blinders on and you're so committed and so focused on getting that done for that unit, y you don't feel like you have the capacity or the time to look beyond your unit. So Course Dog does that for you, is that you don't have to then look up and spend a lot of time chasing down stuff that you know of and trying to chase down things you don't know of. It's that it's already right there. So it gives you that capacity to see the full picture and then be confident that the things you're building is not going to inadvertently completely mess another unit up. I mean, it's really giving you that 360 view without you having to spend an exorbitant amount of time trying to figure out what it is you're looking for. Yeah, that, and that's amazing. That's super helpful context, John. I'm sure it resonates for a lot of folks that are joining us that, you know, the process of submitting the schedule and then having to check for errors or running SQL queries probably sounds familiar to a lot of you folks. Um, just because we're getting a lot of questions related to this, I'll just show you for a quick minute how this works. Um, in Course Dog, after we set up these rules, um, and again, these rules can get super custom. So we can create rules that say there needs to be a balancing section in one department, and then in another department that's not going to apply, but in that department, they need to have all their classes at 2 p.m. It can be very nuanced. And what the system does is it provides, you know, smart recommendations to departments to help make assignments within those rules. So as opposed to them having to figure out all this stuff and, you know, figure out these, you know, more complicated, um, you know, things that they may not, you know, what time blocks are available, what faculty are available at a given time, the system will surface the best potential assignments for them. It can even look at, and NAU they don't do this, but it, things like faculty preference forms, other data by surfacing the best possible assignments that can be made. But if, for example, someone wants to submit something weird, let's say it's a meeting time without a room or something that you traditionally would have seen via your SQL report or via something maybe your business analyst digs up after the fact or the registrar reviews, what we can actually do is give the departments a way to submit an explicit exception request. So they can say, I don't want a room because blah, blah, blah for this course. And what the system will actually do is it will, you can create workflows. So this can be multi-layer, you know, at some institutions, it's one layer. It's just, hey, when a department or a unit submits the schedule, send it to the registrar's office. Maybe you have multiple layers where it goes to a department, you know, a dean and then the registrar and then someone or a provost for approval. But you can define these nuanced workflows so that everyone that needs to approve is going to have this nice centralized dashboard where they can see everything that comes in. 
and seamlessly be able to on the items that are actually vote required, you know, the ones that I am, you know, I am responsible for approving, they can seamlessly approve, reject, you know, tag other viewers to ask for more information. Um, and this will send automatic emails, update your schedule, update your SIS. Um, so the way that the workflow works is we give departments and units the tools to build the best schedules on their own. If they want to submit stuff that's off grid or weird, we can just sit on our dashboard to accommodate that as opposed to having to manually run reports and then negotiate and then go back and forth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to also point out that if you're consistently getting things that don't fit, then that's a signal to, to the registrar's team, Benita, to have a conversation with you and say, do we need to build a rule specifically for you so that you don't have to keep doing it? So again, you're able to sort of track trends and then be able to reach out and say, we want to make this even more robust for you. How can we do that? Exactly. Um, I think we've only got time for probably one more question today. Um, for the ones that were very specific, you know, the course log and our other modules, um, I'll personally follow up after this. Um, but the last one that I guess, um, I, I, I think that a lot of, we're getting a lot of these questions. Um, I think this one's particularly directed to, um, you know, to Benita, but I guess, how did you leverage, you know, your peers? And I think we actually had this conversation, Benita, back in the day, but how did you find out, um, you know, what were the best, and I know this was a collaborative process, what were the best scheduling policies or what schools maybe did you look for for advice? Like, you know, I think a lot of registrars know scheduling at their university, but they might not know the broader picture. Um, are there any types of like readings or recommendations you would have in terms of how you built your community to be able to understand what a good schedule looks like? Well, um, there were various listservs, but um, I started with our peer institutions and uh, contacted them. Um, and from there, they would say, oh, I think so-and-so does this, or oh, I think this university um, has centralized scheduling, or this university focuses on whatever. And so from there, I just built the list out. And so we um, I had one other person, uh, Marilyn, who worked with me at the time, and so the two of us just kind of divided and conquered, and we just started contacting everyone and asking questions, um, and uh, and so that's that's what we started with is is uh, is both the list listserv from um, Acro and um, and uh, Twenty Five Live, and then also uh, our peer institutions. And then from there, all of the all of the additional contacts that they gave us, um, and that actually was most beneficial is those additional contacts. Yeah, what I would say is for anybody doing anything at a university, whether it's policy or best practices or just ideas, every single board of regents, board of trustees, depart, uh, state department of education, educational board, whatever they all require universities to have some sort of peer list. These are your peer institutions. Some even go as far as to say, here, here are your peers and here are your aspirational institutions. I can't emphasize that enough that nothing buys you more credibility with administration than if you say, I looked at all of our, and us, it's the Arizona Board of Regents. I looked at all of our ABOR peer institutions. And this is what they all do. And as we know, peer institutions are difficult. They're not exactly our peers in every way, but hopefully you'll have a wide enough berth that you can find people who do look more like you and that you can then make a case for that. So anytime anything's being proposed on a university-wide scale, I always say, look to your peer institutions or your aspirational institutions and gather the data first and find the ones that speak best to your culture. Awesome. Um, well, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Um, thank you. I, I want to thank um, John and Benita for joining us today. Um, it, that was incredible. I, I can. <laughs> we've got a lot of questions that we didn't answer for today. For anyone that um, wants to follow up, I guess is it. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm guessing you're probably going to get some emails. Um, for anyone that um, is interested 
in having a um, follow-up discussion either you know with John or Benita um, or with myself about course dog and schedule planning best pro practices um, feel free to just leave something in the chat like leave your email or leave your contact in either the zoom chat at the bottom of the screen or the Q&A um, and I can follow up to send along those contacts and also um, if you're interested, send along additional information about course dog as well. Yeah, um, and all emails are easy. It's our name. So John, <laughs> john.masserini at nau.edu and then Benita Swatala. Um, and she's the only Benita on campus. So you'll find her easy. I'm the only Masserini on campus. So if you search us in the directory, more than likely you'll find us. Awesome. And for those of you that want to email me, I will leave my... Uh, email in the chat. I am at jwenig at coursedog.com. Um, that, that's all the time we have for today. John, Benito, was there anything else that you folks wanted to cover? No, just uh, good luck and everybody just keep keep doing, <laughs> keep doing, have it, have the hard conversations and that's, that's how you get there. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everyone for your time. Um, this has been fantastic and 